Okay, uh, it's great to be back. Started seeing a lot of familiar faces again, but let's talk in slightly more technical detail today. It's about the Hitchhiker's Guide to Generative Adversarial Networks. Very fancy name. GANs, they seem to be very popular this year also. But let's get started. Let's see how far we can understand the space. So most of you might have heard about this, but I work for Semantics 3. We work with e-commerce focused companies. We do a lot of machine learning algorithms, data primarily, and also intelligence layers on top of them. We help them cover a lot of automated tasks, like categorization, product matching, automated entity recognition from a product, and of course, a whole slew of offerings. Product matching, distributed crawling is one of our strong points, but I guess this is something you might be interested in. The rest of the talk, nothing related to it, don't worry. So okay, let me give you an overview of how today is going to be structured. We're going to start with a generic overview of why do we study generative networks, what do I mean by generative networks, and what are the things that involve. And then there's a slightly theoretical part. Please don't leave. I think it'll be a little bit of math, but it should be interesting. About the fundamentals of how adversarial networks are set up, about how GANs themselves are structured, and an introduction to the system. And then this is why I didn't want you to leave, because there are huge developments in the last year and then I'd like to motivate them through applications of how they can be really visualized. And this should be a whole bunch of demos. And seeing that this is a guide, this is like across the whole space. I'll have links everywhere in the slides, and then hopefully it points you in the right directions. And then finally, GANs are not going to be the most promising thing. I mean, GANs are very promising, but they are going to be the solution to everything that you see. So let's look at the issues which are commonly faced. And of course, again, improvements and the path forward, moving up to the research which is being conducted. At least the mic still works, so the slides are there. OK. <laughs> Let's look at generative networks, right? So what do we mean by generative networks? So let's get everyone active here. Can you start guessing? On the left, we have a, I think it's a volcano erupting. On the right side, it looks like hills. Can you guess? This should be slightly easy, I think. Can you guess which one was drawn by a computer and one was drawn by an artist, like a real human? Left, right, anyone? Artist on the right, yes, that's Marvin from Douglas Adams. So Marvin also points out the artist on the right. I think sort of you start guessing that it's too abstract. I don't get it. I'm not very artistically inclined. But yes, that's the, that's the bot on the right. Sorry, yeah, so that's the bot. Something harder, maybe? So again, there's one of these was drawn by the bot. And then here I sort of lose track. I don't remember which one was which. So can anyone say? Left, right, left, right. Computer on the left. Very good. <laughs> well done. Again, so that's again some study which was conducted, and then turns out people are quite difficult at making this out. So let's go to insane mode. And at this point, I don't know. So both of these look very similar. Apparently, one is like a very expensive painting, and the other is 30 seconds on a Pentium processor. So let's look at this, and then turns out it's the one on the right. And then, so that seems to be, so I hear, if you look at most of my slides later, you have a description to where the slides are hosted. It's on Ant Hill's website. So if you just click through, you'll be able to see the papers which are referencing this. And then this very recently came out in May this year, I think. El Gamel and his group, they together made this study, and then a lot of people voted on the wrong paintings. So again, these are how generative networks are structured. You essentially want to be able to do forgeries of high-end artwork make money that way. So why do we want to study generative network? We want to understand and tackle complex information, right? We want to be able to study not just classifiers, not just discriminators, not just tracking performance of numbers. We want to be able to understand if there's any underlying structure behind them. And then most of the time, there's like high dimensionality in the objects being studied. So the probability distributions are no longer simple functions of one or two variables. What if we want to dimension it? What if the dimensions are in the hundreds or thousands? We want to be able to model them correctly, and maybe that helps us. Finally, like in the previous examples, we don't want to just model them. We want to maybe generate additional samples based on some criteria. And I think this ties in to the previous talk as well on reinforcement learning, because one of the proposed uses of GANs is to augment the world environment. So say you have a reinforcement agent, and then the agent starts learning, maybe GANs can help fit in and simulate the environment in which the agent learns. So they pretty much tie in together quite nicely at that point. So 
generative networks. It's good to study them. And then let me just motivate how they are going to be structured, right? I'll take a very simple example. Bear with me, it's going to get very messy very soon. But then let's take these points. There's a whole bunch of points on this distribution. And then these are the points which we want to model. Think of these as data points which are structured. Now, one way to do it is something called very popular. It's like maximum likelihood. So wherever we see the points being recorded, we adjust our probability distribution function sort of upwards. So later, if you look at the blue line, it sort of models how the points are distributed in that particular dimension. And this is very common. This is a subset, maybe the most popular one, of how generative functions are formulated. Mathematically, you can define a probability distribution function, P, and then the P is based on parameters theta, and then you start describing this P of model, which gives a sample X conditioned on, or it's basically dependent on theta, the parameters. We want to optimize these parameters, do something like the actual operation where we do gradient descent, back propagation, all those things, but it's basically an operation where you want to optimize the parameters theta. And we want to get P, right? And from P, we get this distribution, and from there, we get the points. So there are two approaches. P can be either explicitly defined, or we aim to define P carefully. That's the one on the left-hand side, explicit density functions. So in that, there are like a whole way of approaches. And then over here at the root nodes, you see all the popular approaches. I'll just focus on a few for now, so that you get an understanding of how everything is set up. So when you look at a, a operation which like aims to get the explicit probability function, you can either do it as a tractable method. So if you look at DeepMind in the last one or two years, I think they came out with WaveNet. WaveNet was where you enter text and then it automatically speaks in very realistic audio. The person speaking sounds like it's a real person speaking and not like your old Microsoft bots. They're good now, but the bots which like use just literally pronounce word by word from recordings. So WaveNet was based on this sort of approach where they had fully visible belief nets which are very popular, WaveNet, but the problem was that it's based on like the probability of conditioning on every single input. So it was like a sequential learner, which was expecting to model the explicit density function. Another very popular approach is the variational autoencoder, where instead of aiming, so we don't want to get the perfect P, we set another function, which is a lower bound on P. We call that maybe L. And then that variational bound is sort of proven to be optimal in some situations, not in all. But the idea is that you sort of optimize your function. And then variational autoencoders are at that stage where they tackle the lower bound towards the explicit density function. That's the left tree for now. On the right hand side, again, they have Markov chains which are very similar. They do repeated resampling, and there are two approaches to it. But for now, FBBNs, variational autoencoders, they are very popular because. They've been giving very good results as well. Implicit density functions, what do I mean? So instead of assuming that a P exists, or instead of aiming to get the P, the probability function, we just assume that it exists. So we say that, OK, there might be a P. I don't care about the probability density function. I instead just try to get the samples out of it. So again, you have stochastic networks, Markov chains. And then in that aspect, so in that subsegment of the tree, where we assume the probability density function, and then we start generating the outputs of the model. That's sort of where our whole talk is going to be centered on. So we're going to look at GANs in this context. So if you start from generative networks in general, GANs sort of fit in this place where they model the probability density, probability density function. So many times. I think you just keep count how many times you say that. <laughs> so that's how GANs are supposed to work. Again, E and Goodfellows very popular NIPS tutorial is there on the link. You should check it out. It's much more than I can fit in 40 minutes. So how do we do this comparison, right? So when I reported WaveNet, which is like a very popular model, unfortunately, it takes two minutes to generate one second of audio. So it's like very difficult to use in real life. It's very popular. It gives very good results. But the computational complexity is sort of like a problem. Guaranteeing asymptotic consistency. What do I mean by this? There are, of course, lower bounds, and you expect to optimize it in terms of autoencoders and VAEs. They sort of don't give you the full result eventually. You hopefully get there, but the guarantees are not 100%. And Markov chain, because of their consistent resampling and continuous requirements, they sort of take a long time to converge. 
if you have played with Markov chains, you realize you don't know how many games to play of the Markov iterations. Again, great description links below. The slides are not exhaustive. Most of these are also based on a lot of, ex lot of existing results. And GANs, again, are not going to be perfect. This is just an example of why GANs do not suffer from these problems. But later on, towards the end, we'll see the problems that they have of their own. So now we can jump into it. Generative adversarial networks. Right. So just to give you an idea, this is like the statistics over the past year. It literally says cumulative GAN, named GANs. So people start calling names for GANs. Sim GANs, Disco GANs, Cycle GANs, DC GANs. So many GANs, right? And then they decided, let's plot a chart. And then even after 2017, you see this right here. It's literally like a zoo. It's like so many abbreviations that people have no idea what to name their GANs. We are running out of abbreviations for GANs. So if you can think of one, make sure to put a preprint and claim your plan. So let's look at the GAN zoo now. And of course, it was very interesting that last week was the Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference. And it turns out Apple started publishing their own research papers. Their first one which came out, which also won the best paper award last week, was on GANs figures. <laughs> so they started generating eyes for other simulations. And it turns out that these were quite effective in training their own models. So things moving very fast. And I guess before I finish my talk, there might be another three or four preprints. So let's look at GANs in more detail. I'd like to, like, like to just talk about the structure, how they fit in, what sort of training is involved. The easiest way, like I said, is adversarial networks. So there are going to be two players over here. By players, I mean eventually two models, two neural networks, two systems. Currently, we just leave them as call them players, right? So there's a D and a G. The names will become apparent very quickly. My slide. Just check. OK. OK, now it works. Maybe it was not selected. So the adversarial game can be formulated with like a game theory formulation. So for those of you who have an idea, it's like a Nash Gist system between two different agents. There's a local equilibrium, hopefully, between the two, which sort of arrives at a stable solution. And then the two names are for discriminator and generator. So one is the forger, the other is the expert. And then they generally are trained together, where they are trained to compete against each other. There are also formulations where you can think of it as a cooperative game. But so far, the way of thinking of it as like a agent where two people fight against each other sort of gives an easier understanding. And then each aims to defeat the other. So when you think of this framework, let's look at this picture again. So this is pretty much how you can explain how a GAN is structured together. So let's look at the right side first, where we have this sort of noise. So you can think of this noise as a vector space. Let's just call it a latent vector space, and I'll denote it by the symbol Z. And then this Z is sort of fed into a neural network, the generator. And then the generator has a function. Let's call it G of Z. And then it starts generating samples. So it just starts generating one example after another based on some random noise, at least initially. So it starts generating outputs. On the other side over here, you have a sample data set. And all of these are real life images or real life examples. So these are not the fake ones, but the real ones. And then these real ones are going to be where we sample our true values. So what happens is that you have this network at the top. That's our second network that will be called our discriminator. Then very simply, the discriminator is either fed a real value, d of x is the function then, or it's fed an output from the generator. That becomes d of g of z. So you have d of x or d of g of z. One of them, you feed one or the other into the discriminator. And then it's like a binary classification problem. It either says it's a real image or it's a fake image. It keeps guessing again and again. And then these two systems are what we are going to train now. One of them starts generating. The other one starts discriminating. So let's look at the relatively easier one to think of first, or the discriminator, which is the one at the top. It thinks of whether it wants to determine if a sample is real or fake. So when the sample is from the real set, it wants to say it's one. When the sample is from the fake set, it sort of casts this function as a zero. So that's like the complication of how it goes about it. 
this is how we want the discriminator to behave. And then this is a very fancy way of saying the two lines here. So we define a loss function, the j, for the discriminator as a function of its parameters theta. And then if you just close your eyes or squint real hard, you can just see here where d of x is the one which needs to become 1 and d of g of z is pretty much in a 1 minus. So the idea is that by combining these two expectation values, we now have a easier way of defining how the loss function needs to be written for the discriminator. So you can think of this as the final loss which is going to be calculated and back propagated through the network for the discriminator's updates. So we have the discriminator, it's quite straightforward, 1, 0, 8, 1 is discriminated. Then we have the generator. For the generator, it, the idea is to fool the discriminator. So we can sort of use like a recursive thinking about it. So what does the generator do? It needs to fool the discriminator. And the simplest way is to just define it as a negative. So you take the discriminator's function, you put a minus sign, you call it for the generator. This is sort of like a min-max game where you make sure that one of them is able to defeat the other. There are a few problems with this because you are thinking of them as two separate networks. So if the discriminator becomes optimal, then the generator stops learning. Because one of the loss becomes zero, you put a negative sign, doesn't matter, it's still zero. So you sort of fool the generator in thinking that it's no longer learning. So there are some heuristic motivations to get another way of defining the loss function for the generator. And one of them is this. So g of z, that's the output function for the generator. And d of g of z needs to be 1. Remember, this is different because the generator wants to fool the discriminator. So he wants to convince people that it becomes 1. So you write like a non-saturating heuristic function. And this pretty much says that the expectation needs to become 1 for the generator's output. This is how the generator thinks about it. There are other ways, like I said, this is formulated in a maximum likelihood type of environment. So you can pretty much cast the equation where you have here, like a logistic sigmoid function on top of the outputs. This is just for completeness so that you understand that this is actually functionally equivalent to the maximum likelihood estimators I was talking about. So this is pretty much just a way of recasting it. So you can think of this as like the two popular ways of how to define a loss function for the generator. So now we have two loss functions, one for the discriminator, one for the generator. What do we do? Stochastic gradient descent, <laughs> most common. So we take two mini batches. We take one from the real samples x, and then we run the vectors on the generator. We get another batch of outputs. So we have two mini batches, one real, one fake. We pass it through the discriminator. It gives you answers. It gives you ones and zeros. And then based on that, you can simultaneously run back propagation on the two networks. So you calculate the loss for the generator, you use it to update the weights for the generator. You calculate the loss for the discriminator, you use it to update the weights for the discriminator. So it's sort of with each run, whatever loss functions you calculate can be used to update both networks. And this sort of joint training is why it sort of it learns together. So for a long time, so this was back in, yeah, I don't have it here, but this was back in 2014. I think when Ian Goodfellow and the others sort of formulated this adversarial system. And then for a long time, there was not enough uh, successful computationally easy implementations for them. There are some things called lab GANs or Laplacian pyramid operators, and using that was slightly difficult. And the whole thing didn't take off until much later when we had our familiar convolutional networks and deep convolution networks being applied to them. So this was sometime in 2015 when a group proposed that you take your layers, you make them all convolutional, remove any pooling or unpooling that you have, and then eventually you start doing batch normalization. And turns out the output of these sort of networks was much more clear, higher resolution, and also easier to train. So just a few pointers here. So what happens here is this is the network of the generator. So we have two networks. This is probably the generator. So you look here, it takes like a vector z, and then it does a whole bunch of uh, convolutions, like strided convolutions over here. It makes it bigger and bigger and bigger, so you can think of the final output as like an image which has been generated. So this image is then going to go into a more traditional classifier, and then that's the one which starts distinguishing whether it's a real image or a fake image. So this is like the deep convolutional GANs which were set up in order to successfully make it work together. So that's about it. Hope that wasn't too much of technical detail.
but now again, we look at very interesting applications. So with that setup of how generators and discriminators are now working against each other, we now have an idea of like the different components involved. And let's just see how that translates to real world applications. And the first thing, which is also from the same paper, which I was referring to DC GANs. And when I saw this, I was like blown away for a few minutes. I had to sit down and think about it. So what happened was that if you remember word to vec and all the complications that arose with it, we look at the example and you see very strong similarities. So when the generator starts generating outputs, people were able to model the ways in which the outputs are related to each other. Let me give an example here. So there were a whole bunch of pictures. All of these are generated pictures. None of them are real pictures. So all of these pictures were generated by the generator for a specific position in the latent vector space. So you have the generator, it takes some noise type of input and then gives these photos of men with glasses. Then for some other point in the vector space, it just gives photos of men. So what do you do? You subtract it out and then you can see where this is headed. When you add a woman with glasses from the vector space in the noise, in the latent vector space, the generator seems to be able to transform it like this. So if you remember the word to vec approach where king minus queen plus man, I, I'm sorry, I got lost here, but <laughs> it's sort of the way where you start seeing that the vector is able to identify the important components in each space. And this was something that was quite interesting. It's not just segments of the image or it's not just lines and edges which are being identified, but it's really the concepts of the image. And this seems to be quite interesting of how the generative networks are learning. There's another recent paper. Most of it is going to be this. So I'll just assume that the link will be there. So you take like a very strong image or very high quality image. So this is like a very good painting, I guess. I think, I think, I think it's a painting. And then you downsample the painting. Say it's a thousand by thousand pixels. You make it much smaller, 200 by 200 or something like that. And then you put it into Photoshop and then you run the bicubic interpolation or some simple method. I hope it's clear, but this is very blurry. So this photo turns out that when you approximate each point by the neighbors, you get a blurry result. However, it is possible to take this sort of blurry downsampled images, run it through something which is called an SR GAN. So many named GANs. So you run through it SR GAN and then it starts generating much more clear images. So it starts giving high resolution images which sort of end up being significant improvements over what was previously proposed. So super resolution seems to be possible now. Interactive GANs. I guess all of us went to school at some point and then you remember there was this art class and the teacher will tell you draw a painting and then everyone goes to the scenery, draw a river, draw two mountains, draw the sun. If you're really fancy, you draw birds and a house in front of it. So again, looks like the Gans are beating, at, at, beating us at it. So over here, what you see is actually a person conveying his intent over like a vector space, over the noise vector space again. And by simply telling them what colors they want, they're able to do things like real-time editing of images. So by simply drawing a white line, he sort of adds snow to the mountain. By drawing like green lines over here, it becomes like a, like a field. The interesting part was that for each of these updates, it was of the order of seconds. So we are literally able to do near real-time edits of the images. So that's about interactive GANs. I think there was another impressive video where they took a photo of a lady and then they started adding black color and then the hair changed from blonde to black. Again, very impressive results. So these are like the rough images, but it actually starts generating high resolution images once you let it to settle down. Image to image translation, again, very popular. Most of you might have already seen it. It's also referred to as pix to pix. And then this is sort of what was being done. So on the left hand side, we have inputs. On the right hand side, we have expected outputs from the generator. Again, this is not a real picture of a street with cars on it. A person sort of described how it will look through segments and then it starts modeling it and starts outputting images which are trained to fake people. Similarly, if you have spatial photographs, say you have a new satellite and it starts taking photographs of the Earth and then you start seeing roads and maps being auto-generated. It can go even further. It can even start doing impressive results, which are being done in Photoshop. Like if you want to convert from black and white to color, 
if you want to go from a day scene to a night scene, if you're an architect and you design a house and then you want to add where the doors and windows are going, it may look impressive here, but if you zoom in, there might be something very weird about it, but I guess it's part of the process of how these guys are still learning. And of course, you can do things like this, where you draw a rough sketch, and then it starts giving realistic interpretations of how it might look in the given domain. It's a great website over here, you can go up, try it. They have very impressive other models, not just the examples here. <laughs> Text to image synthesis. So a few years ago, there was a very popular article where you give a photo and then you start describing the photo automatically. I think Facebook even now does it. If you upload a photo to Facebook, it starts telling you, describing ads with keywords to the photo which sort of describe what's happening there. We'd like to do it in reverse here. So what we do is that we start writing sentences and these vectors sort of condition our inputs. So when we feed to the generator, we sort of add conditional inputs into the vectors and then these sort of vectors, the text vectors which are encoded in, in some vector space, they start determining the output of how the image is going to look like. And then even for me, like, I, I, I couldn't do this right. So you start with describing this and then it starts coming out with realistic photos of how a bird with a red beak and with like a black feathers standing out there. It's also possible very impressively for flowers and some other aspects. So this is literally translation in the context of going from text descriptions to being able to go to images. Again, these are again very cherry picked examples and all of that, but it seems impressive that it even works in the first place. Image uh, completion, and what do I mean by this? It's about corrupted images, right? So there are a whole bunch of celebrities here. You might recognize a few, I don't recognize most of them, but you cut out their nose and then you train the network on how to do in painting over these images and then it starts to identify that a nose is most probably the structure over there. It starts to match the color and the shape with the rest of their faces and again all of these are ways in which the whole system becomes a part of it. So it starts to generate sort of realistic results and again generative networks at the center of it. You start noticing a trend, most of the results are 2016 or 2017. So that's like the last year is when most of the things are happening and it keeps improving day to day. Multiple GANs, which I think is 2017, now, right now, a few months ago, where stacked GANs and people are able to describe them as combining two GAN networks. So instead of having a generator discriminator by itself, you take another pair of generator discriminators and then you put them together and you start training them to identify relationships across domains. So what happens here is that if you go out shopping and then you have a shoe which is in a particular style, then you want to get a bag which matches that style. So they started being able to generate samples which are consistent across their whole catalog. Very impressive results. And then there's a new one. So this was called Disco Gans. And the other one was called Cycle Gans. Don't have to remember the names, but yeah. So there's this horse over here. And they were able to like take a photo or a video of the horse running around. And one network was able to do it into, convert it into a zebra. So when I looked at this, I thought, okay, that looks like a zebra, but the tails were weird. Turns out zebra trails are not striped. But I didn't know that, so yeah. <laughs> and then you could also do it the other way around, where zebra could be converted into a horse. So these sort of GANs were able to do it in either way. So you, you have stacked GANs, multiple GANs, and then it's just going to be all the way down. You keep going with GANs. So very impressive results. And of course, I have a few more minutes, and then I'm going to talk about the issues that were happening, what is the state of the art research, and if you want to go to NIPS this year, I think it's already closed, the papers have been accepted, but most probably they're going to end up talking about things like these. So stability and other problems. Let me just talk about it in brief detail. So finding equilibriums are hard, because like I said, this is not a explicit loss function which is just being optimized. We need to be able to do sort of a joint system where optimizing not just one network, but together with another one. So the local equilibrium points are sometimes local minima which you end up being stuck in. Non-convergence has always been a problem, especially, especially something called mode collapse. So what do I mean by that? So say you have pictures of dogs, and then the idea is that you want to start generating fake pictures of dogs. You feed it like a Labrador, a pug, a golden retriever, and then you start teaching it all these types of dogs. But what happens is that 
as mentioned like in the few weeks, I mean like the few talks earlier, some people were saying that the network sort of learns to cheat and it starts realizing that, okay, I, I will just start generating bugs. And then those are like valid dogs throughout. So it ends up that we sort of collapse into like a diversity problem. The network starts generating very, very similar looking examples. And of course, there's one thing which I sort of skipped because it wasn't very apparent over there, which is the differentiability requirements for the loss functions and the whole networks. So you remember our D of Z or D of Z and G of Z, both of them, either of them, the functions need to be differentiable. I didn't go into much of the mathematics, but the idea was that this constrains us to sort of continuous functions which are being output. So working with text has been a problem in this area. So most of the functions or most of the outputs, you might have noticed a trend, are all images. There are approaches which are looking at generating text with realistic results, but none too convincing so far. There are workflows, but let's see. Yeah. And how do we improve GANs? So stability has been a problem for a long time. I'll just leave all of this here. Okay. So the first few are on hacks on how to improve GANs. The Sumit Chintala has like a very popular repository where he literally lists you if you want to train GANs, just follow these steps. And one of the idea is that like the first vector space Z in which you start generating the outputs, instead of having it as like a noisy uniform distribution, you sort of have it like a spherical space and that seems to give slightly better results. One sided label smoothing, which may be applicable to other domains as well, essentially means that instead of going from 0 or 1, you sort of adjust your labels so that your output is like a 0 0.8 or a 0 0.7. This sort of still conveys the information that you are good, but sort of adds noise at the layers. Finally, you also have reference normalizations, batch normalizations. These are some things which are done. By this, the losses which are computed and the intermediate layers, the normalization is done slightly differently. And finally, this is sort of like the big problem with GANs, which people are still working on. It's about stability in all of these systems. So when the two networks are learning against each other, we're not very sure on how stable the outputs are going to perform. So people are looking at different ways. They are continuing to look where very, almost all of them are 2017, but most of them are still trying on how to ensure that stability is a solved problem. One easy or one effective approach seems to be conditioning on how realistic the output looks. So instead, so how do you judge the quality of a fake image, right? Everyone has their own opinion. So when you start judging the quality of fake images, people started defining it using other distance functions, like this Wasserstein was one of them. So you start defining other loss functions and other distances based on that, where you make sure that the realism of the image is sort of an important parameter. There are also auto-encoder approaches like BEGAN and BEGAN. Okay, that's actually a word now. So BEGAN and then these approaches sort of like help define or help set the stage for stability problems to be solved. I'm quite sure there are a lot more to be covered, but I'll leave all of these here. So that was the guide to GANs. You can visit this link for the slides and the content and all the references. Hopefully it's useful. I just wanted to give a presentation on all the overview. Maybe hopefully it's useful when you start searching off. Hitchhiker's Guide to GANs, that was me, Ramadan, and thank you very much. We'd love to offer you a few minutes for questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get you a mic. Whoa, I've got two right down here. I'll give you a mic. Um, please stand when you give your question and identify who you are. We are doing a live stream. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I'm Vipul. Uh, so my question was around, you said that the differentiability requirement is causing problems with discrete outputs. So that applies when I'm trying to go from, say, text to true text. Uh, so you can't do my homework yet. But uh, so what about other forms of continuous outputs? For example, uh, so images is one, but what about, uh, say, graphs or, you know, uh, time series and things like that? So have there been areas like... Uh, I think there have been few approaches, especially like at the start where people are trying to generate audio based samples or even for images, right? You can think of it as, so essentially the pixels are going to be numerical values which are being generated. So I would think that if you want to solve problems which are time series or value based, the same encoding system or again, I, have, I don't remember of any specific approaches which I work, but if you look at an image when you actually type it out, it's going to be a series of numbers, pixel values. So I think that might still work. And 
those are not discrete yet, but quite sure it might work. I have not, I don't remember, I, I can't remember here of any specific examples. Our next question is over there. Hi, Shalmi oh. from Berkeley. So when you showed the equation for this, uh, uh, when, I, when you looked at it for the de degenerative equation, okay. so it's either log, when you said it's only binary. Okay. So what if the probability is an equal percentage? So does it, does it again go back into the network? And in the yes, so I didn't talk about how the network terminates. So what happens is that when you start off initially, the discriminator sorts has like this option between 0 and 1 and the whole structure is based on whether the loss is like a finite value. When the discriminator becomes confused between a half, so it says x is half, z is half, that's sort of the end stability condition. That's ideally when you stop the training. So what happens is that at that point, you're at the place where the generator is like completely as good as it can get. And then that's essentially the stopping condition. So if you have the output of the discriminator stuck at half or 0 0.5, and then it cannot differentiate between the real and fake images, that's at the point where you start seeing that you stop your condition and that's sort of the end state of your training. Yes. Yes, so the equilibrium condition is exactly that. The equilibrium condition is that the discriminator fails to generate any difference yeah, between, the op between the two images. All right, the next question is right here in the middle. Hi, hello. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so what's very interesting is this discriminator is also strengthening through, through the process. Um, and the discriminator is effectively... Sorry, I couldn't hear it quite clearly. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Okay. Yeah. I said what's very interesting is that so both discriminator generator are strengthening through the process. Discriminator is effectively a classifier. Okay. Have yes. There, are there learnings for the effectively the architecture or the way the discriminator um, eventually strengthens for other classification problems? Yes. So this was in fact something which was quite interesting was that you have two networks which are being done here, and most of the results are focusing on the output of the generator. So one thing which might be possible is to take a very good discriminator which has been trained using this process and literally start using it as a classifier for other types of problems. That's definitely what motivated me also because I'm more used to classification problems. So this discriminator by itself might have significant uses in solving classification problems. It might not be trained explicitly on the classification problem that you are trying to solve. But again, there's definitely some amount of transfer learning or some amount of pre-trained weights which might be useful. I'm not sure, but hope, I'm quite sure there are, but I, off the top of my mind, I'm not sure, yeah. But it's definitely something we should look out for. We have a question way in the back. Hi, uh, great talk. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so my question is, like, uh, there are two parts in GAN, right? So one is generator and the other one is discriminator, right? So most of the applications which we saw was from the generator part. So uh, is there any, uh, like, can we use the discriminator part for, uh, like, building something? Exactly. I think that's exactly what the <laughs> previous question was also about. So I think the utility of the generator is what has been discussed so far. I also strongly believe that the discriminator needs, could also be used. And I think most of the times when you want to use the discriminator, it's sort of not in the image context, but maybe in the classification context, and some of those are quite useful. We have not seen anyone try to use the discriminator for like image net classes or anything like that. But I think for simple binary operations of like deciding whether an image is of a particular class or not, I think discriminators are still able to do quite significantly. Whether they have been used anywhere so far for any classification problems, I'm not, I'm not aware of any. Yeah. Okay, yes. Hey, Ramana. Yeah. Hi, great talk. So Thank you. Yeah. is on more on the ethical sense. Like, recently, you might have come across all the fake news, like, Obama's Sorry, I can't hear you very clearly. Uh, maybe slightly closer. Hello. Oh, okay, better. Hey, Ramana. Great yeah. talk. So, this question is more on the ethical sense. Like, uh, you might have come across the recent uh, fake news generation, like, Obama's speech has been mocked. Okay, as in, yes. Uh, what we can do. So, how... GANs are like helping in tackling this fake news challenge or are there any, are there any countermeasures to handle such fake news that are getting generated using GANs? Like, have so do you mean for speech based inputs for GANs? Because text based filtering 
not aware of any good results because of the whole problem with discrete inputs and discrete outputs. Right. But for filtering of voices, uh, are there any ways that, like we can identify this is generated by computer so that the fake news can be tackled in, in the future? Possibly, hopefully, you get a network which is uh, so again. It's this so involves so using the discriminator component. Yeah. I think yeah. So in the discriminator component, I'm. If you have a generator which is aiming to model the, the fake news part of it, quite sure that as long as you generate your samples consistently, it might be able to, the encoding into a representation of what a fake news represents is the actual problem in my opinion. So getting the representation right might be an issue. All right, we have time for one more question. And we have a question down here. Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, this could be the same as uh, seconding his ethical question. One way you are talking about, uh, you know, I explain about the thief and you can draw the uh, using GANs. But at the same time, when I look at the, yeah, when I look at the disco GANs, I see that uh, the house is being uh, changed to Gibra. Okay. So I, I can actually put some false, uh, some wrong person in the same video. Uh, usually in the judiciary system, we kind of rely on the videos as well. Is there uh, any kind of regularity uh, on this kind of entire research, or uh, the implementations and the research? Good question. So far, there have been very convincing results. I think a week ago, someone made a, made a picture of Obama speak very realistically, things which he never said. The legal issues are still a minefield. I have no idea on how people are going forward. There are a few organizations which are looking at it. EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, OpenAI to an extent, all of them are looking at the ramifications of how reinforcement learning systems, GAN systems, generative networks, how all of these fit into the broader context of how it might cause issues. Uh, we're still not sure. Some people are convinced that it's going to destroy the world. Some people are convinced that it's merely a pet project. But we still need to have reasoning with the entire society, it's no longer computer scientists who are going to determine these things. But yeah, it's too, too soft of a skill for me to think about, yeah. Yes, yeah, so. This is such an interesting topic and I think we could probably have questions all day long. Um, Ramanan, would you take questions offline during the break? Yeah, sure, I'll be here the rest of the day at least for a while and then be happy to meet you anywhere outside also. Fantastic, well, it's time for a break. Um, before you guys go out to get your chai or coffee or whatever caffeine you need. <laughs>